Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here or you've been sitting in the shadows and you're enjoying what you're hearing, please make sure to make friends with that subscribe button and then setting your notification bell to all. That way you don't miss any new videos uploaded, which tends to be daily. Also, if you would like to learn how to become a member or buy me a coffee as a special thank you, all of that information can be found down below. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Intruder Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Oh, and a quick note, story three is broken into three parts, but I'm going to read it as one, so it will be extremely long. So this happened when I was 13. My father trusts me when it comes to minding my younger siblings, so here was everyone in the house. Me, a 13-year-old, my little siblings, Sarah, who was 11, JJ, 8, and my cousin, Crystal, who was 11. Oh, and my older sister, Bella, who's 17, who wasn't there at the time. My father had left to go get some shopping done, and he left me in charge. About an hour in, everything's going fine. Nothing out of the ordinary. I was making pasta for my Sarah and Crystal. I was talking to Crystal whilst making the pasta, and I turn to her, and we see this roughly six-foot-tall guy standing at our kitchen window. I immediately turned to Crystal, and he ran past the window, and Crystal's conversation went something like this. Crystal... You saw that, right? Yes, I did. Who is that? I don't know. Go tell Sarah and JJ to put their shoes on. We're going to Bella's. She's at our friend's, and he lives right around the corner. Crystal goes to Sarah, and they get their shoes on. JJ was upstairs playing games on his Xbox. Crystal and Sarah wouldn't go up there. They were terrified. So I got a knife out of my own shoes and we all went upstairs sarah was crying at this point but we got jj he put his shoes on and we got downstairs but we heard a scream outside and i decided that we stay in the house and if somebody comes in crystal sarah and jj would go and lock the bathroom door and stay there and nothing happened no one came in we heard one last scream, and that was it. So to the creepy guys who were outside my kitchen window, we pray we never see you again. I haven't quite told my story, and I don't know why, but I'm going to share it with you. So, here we go. I attended a liberal art college in a historic southern city, which happens to be a popular tourist attraction. My sophomore year, summer of 2007, my friends and I lived in what was dubbed as the gravel pit, which was exactly that, a row of houses that sat facing each other on a gravel driveway or pit. The pit was located on kind of a sketchy street, but was located short walking distance to the main strip of the bars, so it was a popular living spot for sophomores at my college. After a debauchery-filled year living there, my roommates and I all decided to move elsewhere after the year was over. Like I said, it was mostly a sophomore year hotbed. I was the last to move out during the summer of 07, and thus had to spend one last night in the house alone before moving the next day. As a quick note, I notoriously was bad about locking the front door back then. 
I would only think to lock the door when I was going to bed and sober, hence not a lot during the sophomore year. Once had my purse stolen upon drunkenly leaving it on the porch, I have since learned better. It was about 6 p.m. when my now former roomie and one of my best friends, Pam, called me to ask if she could stay with me at the house even though she'd technically moved out. Parking was, or is, a bitch in this city, and her parking permit wouldn't go into effect until the next day, so she was worried about it getting towed. I enthusiastically agreed. I didn't have to spend my last night in the house alone after all, so yay. Pam gets to the house at around six and immediately locks the front door upon arriving, something I obviously had not done at the time and wouldn't have done until going to bed that night. It should be noted that my room was a first floor bedroom with a door that led directly outside to our side porch, which was immediately accessible to anyone walking by. So we're sitting in my room watching TV when we hear it. Someone frantically jiggling the front doorknob trying to get in. Pam and I looked at each other in horror, but chalked it up to typical gravel pit shenanigans, a junk person, etc. The only unnerving part was how insisted the person was. They must have jiggled that handle for two to three minutes. It finally stops. Pam and I look at each other in relief and proceeded to finish watching TV. But then we proceeded to hear the person stomp over to the side porch, a.k.a. the side of the porch that leads directly into my bedroom. Homeboy then proceeds to bang on the door outside my bedroom before spending another minute trying to jiggle the locked doorknob and force himself in. After several terrifying moments of this, we peek out of the window to see a disheveled man with his hand in his pocket, trying with all of his might to get inside. As I'm frozen in fear, especially because it was an old house and his increased force could have easily broken through that wooden door, Pam just yells, No! The banging stops for a bit, and we think he's gone for good until he proceeds to cross the porch again, and again proceeded to try to bang down the door, the locked front door. As Pam is calling 911, I have since realized my immediate response to danger is to freeze. Thank God for Pam. He then returns to the side door to my room and proceeds to aggressively try to force his way into my bedroom. The police show up a short time later, and the man is gone. All we had was a vague description of him from what we snuck a peek from the blinds. The police had found the guy was nowhere to be found, but the creepiest part is what they did find. There were chicken bones littered all over the porch and outside the porch entryway and door to my bedroom. Plus, there were some scattered in the bushes outside of our place. Nothing came out of it, though, and the police just told us to call if it happened again and to leave our doors locked. I constantly wonder what would have happened had Pam not stayed with me or been there. If she hadn't, my front door would have been unlocked, and the chicken bone man would have certainly gotten into my house to do God knows what. I've never been so grateful for Pam's working issue that led her to stay with me. Not to mention that I was moving out of that horror show the next day. I no longer reside in that city, but still, make it to a point to lock the door as soon as I walk in versus when I'm simply going to bed. That said, chicken bone man who was hell bent on getting into my house Let's not ever meet again. This is going to sound bizarre and made up, but I swear on my left nipple that this happened. And there are several witnesses. Even I can't explain why someone would do this. 
I'm fairly positive this isn't anything paranormal. I live quite a distance off the road in an unmarkable house on private property. My neighbors are all older family members who go to bed extremely early and whose children are already grown and out of the house. In summary, there are no mischief makers to play pranks on us here. A few months ago, my mother and I stayed up late one evening watching television together. At around 3 a.m., I turned the television off and decided to go to bed. As I was leaving the room, I began to hear what sounded like carnival music playing outside of my house in the front yard. It was loud and close. My mother heard it too and immediately went to the window to investigate. She couldn't see anything but darkness. Everyone else was either asleep for the night or away on vacation. The lights were off in all of their houses, and none of them would be caught dead listening to anything but country music anyway. We were miles from the nearest city, so it wasn't the product of noise pollution. You can hear when a car has pulled up in the yard, but there was no sound of a car. The silence where we live is usually deafening. All you can hear is the ringing in your ears. Where did this song come from? Who was playing it and why? I was very unsettled by the idea of a stranger in our yard playing carnival music. As such suggests malicious intent. My father and uncle later mentioned that 20 years ago when my parents first moved in, the electrician had come to install a ceiling light and stopped in the middle of his work, saying he could hear Pink Floyd playing in the front yard. Neither my father nor uncle could hear it. My father is a bit hard of hearing, and my uncle is much older. So they laughed it off and thought the man was insane. But the electrician was really freaked out. He kept opening the door and trying to find the source of the noise to no avail. Then it hit me. The song I had heard the night was Pink Floyd's Circus Minor, the part that sounds like carnival music. I played the song for my mother, and she began freaking out, saying, Yes, y y yes, that's what I heard. Who the hell sits in my yard at night at 3 a.m. in the middle of nowhere playing the same song, which isn't even a popular song? 20 years later, with no car. Where did they come from? They would have had to have walked several miles to get here. Aside from this, the only other strange thing we experience that would suggest an intruder. We feel and hear knocking on the living room window late at night around the same hour, sometimes so intense that the entire wall of the house is rattled and it sends the couch against it to a reclining position. There are no nearby trees to trap the glass, and no animal except a human could possibly reach it. Fortunately, this has stopped over the past few weeks. A few months had gone by, and I had almost convinced myself our intruder was long gone when, as I saw standing up in the early hours of the morning to finish a bit of homework, I heard a noise in the yard just outside my window. I sat there listening, but could only detect something like machinery. It was not a sound that I recognized. I couldn't imagine what was causing the noise unless the air conditioner was misbehaving, but once it had quieted down, I finished working and went to sleep. About two hours later, I heard loud grinding around that same hour but again, could not determine the source. However alarming, the volume was. The following morning, my father discovered someone had sabotaged our air conditioning unit by first removing a piece of its inner machinery and later throwing it into the fan while it was spinning, effectively destroying its blades and a few other pieces. The part had presumably been taken the first time I was disturbed by activity in the yard and thrown back in the second time. I had noticed it only because the outdoor unit is mounted against my bedroom. We thought initially that the piece, and forgive me for the ambiguous language, 
as I'm not very technology savvy, had loosened by itself and broken down, but we called our repairman, who begged to differ. He was surprised by the degree of damage and insisted he had never seen it happen naturally. Suspecting someone had removed several screws and tampered with the unit, he thought my father had attempted to work on it and cause the trouble, but, of course, he had not. A few days after the damaged parts had been fully replaced, my mother was leaving for a doctor's appointment when she began yelling and called the family into the yard. Our electric box was opened in the night and left ajar as if someone had been trying to find a wire to cut our electricity or disable a suspected indoor security system. We had been outside several times since the repairman finished his work, and we are certain he closed that electric box, if he ever even opened it. We have weathered several severe hurricanes here, and winds are not strong enough to open our electric box. A person had to have done it. Weeks passed without incident, my parents opting to overlook those concerning happenings. My father tried to explain the air conditioner as a freak occurrence. They purchased a new gun and did little else. Towards the beginning of the summer, my grandfather mentioned that, a couple weeks prior, when we were on vacation, he'd seen a red jeep drive the lengthy distance from the road through our private property to our house in broad daylight. He didn't recognize the driver, but approached and questioned him. The man claimed he was looking for a woman that lived in a trailer. The person he claimed he was looking for had the name of a family friend that lives hours away from us. The man was behaving strangely, and my grandfather was not convinced by his story. He ordered him to leave immediately. Our family that lives around us on the farm is reinforcing their doors, installing extra locks, and keeping their children out of their yards until we found out what's going on. They won't even let them walk home from the bus stop anymore. I had stopped worrying over it as much because I've been preoccupied with moving to a new state. But the old knocking returned this evening at 10 p.m. My parents were watching television together when they heard it. They turned on the porch light and peered out the peephole of the back door to investigate but saw no one. At 3 a.m., I was awake watching television when it sounded as if someone forcefully punched the glass of the usual exposed window. I covered it with a blanket, as I always do. An hour after I covered the window, I began to hear loud noises from our back door porch off the kitchen, as if someone had stepped on it. However, it was briefly lived. They apparently weren't walking around, but simply standing there. About ten minutes later, I heard yet more knocking, except this time it wasn't on the exposed living room window, but further down in the hall. The window was on, next to the couch. It was three knocks, forcible enough to rattle the wall a bit, but not so much the couch moved. This is more alarming because it suggests the trespasser lingers here for several hours at a time, poising many questions. Are we being watched for an opportunity to force entry? Hasn't the opportunity already risen in the past and they never took it? Are we being stalked? Do they gather here to drink and get high on the property and then decide, in their stupor, it will be funny to antagonize us? Why is it only our house that is targeted and not the other houses on the farm? Why do they walk several miles to come here? Their behavior is escalating. Will they eventually take things further? I woke my mother and we sat awake together until the sun rose to keep watch. We compiled a list of happenings here that suggest our trespasser visits more frequently than they knock. 
Despite no one in the family smoking, and anyone who does smoke living too far away from us to smell it, we often deal with the strong scent of a cigarette around windows or the front and back doors of the house. This happens at our bedroom windows with alarming regularity. Other times it's strong cologne or a chemical stench like a fresh perm. We of course remembered how my aunt's dogs will bark intently at odd hours of the night, like they do when a stranger visits and the motion detecting yard light has previously come on when no one is home at my grandfather's. My mother and I are going to walk around the perimeter of the house in the morning to look for cigarette butts and will try convincing my father we at least need security cameras outside, even though I think we should involve the police at this point. He's been too indifferent to everything that has happened, and it makes it challenging to be proactive about our safety. Some time goes by, and finally, we have a resolution to this situation. We believe the culprit has been approached and arrested. Despite the insistence of myself, my parents never installed security cameras. My father remained resistant to the idea, most likely because he wasn't willing to admit that something was amiss. In the beginning, he complained about the cost, the possibility of hackers and the difficulties with mounting a camera. He eventually promised to borrow someone's trail camera, but he never broached the subject with them. I moved to another state, and the need for the camera was no longer at the forefront of my mind. But when I remembered and received my new debit card after some unfortunate identity theft, I offered to pay for one. I told my father that I would personally buy a camera or two and have them delivered. Only then did he confess that he was afraid of seeing something spooky on it. He had the childlike idea that if he never saw anything happening, the problem would resolve itself. Despite all odds, the problem did resolve it. Not long after I moved out, my grandfather who lives in a separate house on the same farm, came home to find local police cars in his driveway. A police officer approached him and asked if he had owned another house on the farm, as he needed to speak to the landlord about his tenant. The house in question is occupied by a late relative's widow, who has a lifetime estate. My grandfather explained that the property is a part of the farm, which is owned collectively by him and his daughters. Because of this, he was permitted knowledge of what happened there. The officer explained everything. Apparently, the window, who is quite old and infirm, used the death of my relative as an excuse to move in her chronically unemployed, drug-addicted family. Among them, her daughter, her son-in-law, her son-in-law's brother, and her nephew. Because they don't own their own separate cars, and we seldom visit the widow. She stinks, and she's generally unlikable. So we social distance around her before the pandemic ever happened. This transition went undetected. Shortly before my grandfather had returned home that day, the police responded to a 911 call from the widow. Her nephew is apparently involved in a gang and has violent tendencies. Some conflict arose in the household, probably related to how many drug addicts were stuffed together under a single roof for 24 hours a day. All we were told is that the nephew was becoming violent. When the police arrived, they realized there was an outstanding warrant for his arrest. He was wanted for making meth, which, interestingly, commenters on my last story blamed for the stench who had been smelling. And for assault, the nephew was hiding from the law at the widow's house. This is the reason his presence was concealed from us on the rare occasions that the widow was outside of her home and we spoke. 
he was removed from the home and arrested by the officers. Ever since then, there has been no strong chemical odor outside and no knocking on the window late at night. We suspect he was aware of this farm long before moving in, and it was his go-to spot for recreational drug use. The widow was around 89 years old and had her first child at approximately 13 with her first spouse. So her nephew is elderly himself and would have likely been doing drugs and playing as being Floyd music here 21 years ago too. We're thinking he could occasionally spend the night at the widow's house over the years and walk towards the fields near us to do drugs. It makes sense that we never heard a car accompanying the knocking noises because he doesn't own a car and the house is not far since it's a part of the farm. The only incident that remains unexplained is the man who drove to our house when we weren't home and asked my grandfather about a family friend that lives hours away. I wonder if they were looking for the meth head and were told to give some sort of code to make sure he was at the right house. The name could have just been a coincidence. I had an internet incident a few months that suggested some stalkerish activity, but that is probably unrelated. I apologize for such a long story, but I'm satisfied with this explanation since there has been no repeat occurrences after his arrest. In 2018, I lived with my partner and my German Shepherd in a west side neighborhood of Chicago. I was 33 years old, and our apartment was a fourth floor walk-up unit. Very typical low-budget Chicago rental in a changing neighborhood. The layout of our building is going to matter to this story. Our building had a total of 12 units. Mine and the three below me had a shared front entrance. All 12 apartments had connected back porches and stairs that shared a walkway to the rear gate, which leads to an alley. From the front stairwell, there are windows on each landing to the back porches, so you can see the back door of the apartment when standing at the front of the door looking through that window. We had good relations with our neighbors, especially those that lived directly below us and shared our front door. This was the thing that saved all three of us, my partner, my dog, and me. My partner was in a touring band at the time and would leave for weekends or weeks at a time. And it was a scary thing for me because I was sexually assaulted and stalked by an ex in my teens and 20s. I always worried something would tip him off and he would start showing up again. A little less than a month before a two-week tour my partner had scheduled, I received a creepy Facebook message from that stalker ex from yet another new account. About a week after that, my car was broken into. The glove box was emptied. Things were thrown around, but the only thing that was taken was a bag of dog treats. I had about $20 in change in the compartment between the seats, and they left the money. I was on high alert at that point and very scared about the time I'd be alone during the tour. My partner was kind of irritated with me and the situation and felt that it was too last minute to cancel, especially over what amounted to be a bad feeling and a few isolated things that weren't direct threats. And truthfully, car break-ins are very, very common in Chicago. It's happened to me like 15 times, and police usually do the reports over the phone and don't even come to the scene. What I found really strange was that the thief didn't take the money. There was always a homeless man who had started camping on the boulevard nearby recently. My partner left for his tour, and I set up cameras and bought door braces for my front and back doors. 
I became completely nocturnal, unable to sleep at night. My poor dog developed diarrhea, maybe because she was picking up on my stress level. It meant that I was taking her down all four flights of stairs for her to go blast her bowels six or seven times a night. I had the distinct prickly crawling sensation of being watched when I would take her out, but I couldn't tell what was genuine and what was my own fear and paranoia. Her diarrhea lasted an unusually long time, like three or four days. I was going in and out the main door a lot, feeling very scared, and I noticed that some of the neighbors wouldn't pull their door all the way closed, so the lock engaged. I mentioned it to my downstairs neighbor one day, including that I was extra careful because of the stalker. He was supportive, said he'd mention it to the other neighbors if he saw them and I noticed that the door was locked more frequently after that. My partner came home at about 11 a.m. on a Sunday morning. At about 8.30 a.m. that morning, my first floor neighbor's place was burglarized. He was a meth head dude who collected instruments, sold weed and psychedelics, and lived alone. I guess he went out for breakfast and he left his door unlocked while he was gone. Someone had come in, eaten the leftovers in his fridge, took a coat and a pair of boots, left a filthy coat and pair of boots, took his college diploma, but left $500 in the same cabinet. They left all the expensive musical instruments and mixing equipment, left the drugs, but did take a set of keys. The keys were to the first floor apartment and a master key for the front door and the back gate. My neighbors ran into each other right after the break-in, and the second-floor neighbor said to go tell no, Donut, because she has a stalker. So my metalhead neighbor came up to let me know what had happened. My partner had just gotten home from his tour when he knocked on the front door. I jumped out of my skin but looked through the peephole and recognized him and the three of us stood on the stairs at my front door while he told us about the break-in. We jabber-jawed for a while, about 15 and 20 minutes. While we were talking, we heard the front door open and close below us, but thought nothing of it. Then we saw a man climbing up my back porch steps to my back door through the window. There was no other apartment he could have been going to and he had to walk past all 11 more accessible units on his way to mine. He was not my stalker. I did not recognize him, but his image is burned in my mind. He was wearing flashy black and white high-top sneakers, not the ones stolen from downstairs. His black coat was oversized and hanging off of his shoulders. We locked eyes through the window, and he froze halfway up the stairs to my back porch. He slowly took a cell phone and called someone as he slowly turned around halfway up the stairs. He walked back down the stairs in artificially slow motion, like he was pretending to be nonchalant, and then bolted into a sprint as soon as he hit the porch below mine. My neighbor ran downstairs and dialed 911. My partner and I ran through the apartment to the back porch and saw a sedan and windowless van pull up from the sketchy building two doors down. Both cars floored it out of the alley. We didn't get the plates, but the cops said it wouldn't have mattered. There wasn't any crime committed and nothing concrete to justify stopping them. They were condescendingly explaining this to me as they took my statement later. My neighbor is the one who actually made the call and has the police report. My partner and I were just considered witnesses. For a long time, the thing that scared me the most was the tool that my neighbor found when he went running downstairs. It was a two-by-four piece of wood cut to about two feet and about six inches of it had been made into a handle. 
it looked like a paddle and for a long time i couldn't figure out what it was but i'm pretty sure it was a ram for the door jams and locks when i looked at my door afterwards it looked like the frame had been repaired like it had been broken before kind of like it seems like they used the one master key to place the ram get somebody at the back door to catch me if i tried to run out of the way and nobody else was going to come back around since they only had one key and they'd break in my front door and go forward with whatever they had planned when we caught them before they could catch me unaware they seemed to have aborted the plan i suspect that's been watching me especially while i was taking out my dog and figured that i was gone it was pure coincidence that my partner had gotten home 30 minutes before all of this. I feel that we all could have been horribly injured or worse, had been trapped inside, and they had gotten the jump on us. Nothing else ever came of it except that my landlord refused to change the locks, but he did agree to let us out of our lease. I moved out of Chicago and now have added a younger dog I'm training to do some bite work. My house is surrounded by cameras and floodlights and wingnut neighbors. So, whoever was on my back porch and whatever they had planned, I hope I never see you again. This happened about two or three years ago. My uncle had cancer and wasn't doing very well. He had gotten his leg amputated two years prior to the events of this story and had been improving since then. But all of a sudden, he took a turn for the worst. We were visiting him and honestly, he gives the same sort of vibe as Jeff Goldblum bourgeois fancy but in like an elegant way that wasn't obnoxious he was an older man in his mid-fifties or so and both of his sons no longer lived at home he lived with my aunt that night my parents and i had ice cream while he drank wine and we talked about various things that i don't really remember he asked me to sit on his lap as i was his favorite niece i felt bad for him and obliged and i could feel how weak and bony he was getting later that night i was reading a book when my father came downstairs and told me they were taking my uncle tim to the hospital he had gotten really bad really fast and so he was headed to the er i was left in the house alone as they went out I actually liked being alone and didn't mind at first, but as the night dragged on, I began to get this mysterious feeling of anxiety. I decided to go upstairs from the basement and lay against the heated floors in the living room, as they did soothe me. From the living room, there was a sliding glass door with a view of the backyard. In fact, Anyone in the backyard could see right into the living room. I was playing this rhythm game on my 3DS, and so I had my earbuds in, when suddenly I felt the anxiety return. This time it was much worse, to the point where I called my dad to ask them when they were coming home. He didn't pick up, so I texted. When I looked up, I saw something odd in the backyard. Despite it being very late in the night, it seemed like a man, but I couldn't be sure with such limited lighting. By the way, I froze and nearly pissed myself before running downstairs. Being 14 or 15, I was well aware of what dangers befell girls late at night alone. I ran upstairs and considered calling the cops, but I didn't want to attract any extra attention when my uncle deserved a quiet end. I knew he wasn't going to get through this. Instead, I decided to peek through the shades from one of my bedroom windows. 
a man walked into the dim light by the porch, looking right into the glass door. I was about five seconds away from passing out due to fright. He was a tall sort of fella with dark clothes. I'm pretty sure it was summer, since I remember noting how odd it was that he was wearing a thick scarf. However, I couldn't see his face or anything detailed about him. I began to call my mother and father again, but the call wasn't going through. He was at the hospital, and in certain places, I assume they don't have cellular. I figured maybe it was a gardener. My uncle was wealthy, after all, and it wouldn't have surprised me that he hired someone. I know it's stupid to think that looking back now, but I really didn't want to be a nuisance when my uncle was dying. The moment the man circled around to the front of the house, I ran down the stairs and headed to the basement. The stairs downstairs to the first floor were on the other side of the house, but the stairs to the basement were in the kitchen, in plain view of the patio glass door. I was so scared that I locked myself in the cramped space under the stairs. It was a sort of small place with a hole in the wall where a film projector was. I could play movies on the screen downstairs, and you went into the cupboard underneath the stairs to use the projector. I had enough room, even with the old toys thrown in here, once my cousins had gotten too old. I suddenly froze when I heard the patio door slide open. It was quiet, but the entire house was silent. It couldn't have been my family. But why would they use the back door? I just knew that it was the man from out back, and I immediately started breathing quickly. I could hear footsteps upstairs and things moving. At one point, he was right above me, his feet echoing on the stairs. It was dark in the basement, though, and thankfully, the door was rather nondescript. After a few minutes, he went back downstairs. I think he was in the house for maybe 15 to 20 minutes, though it felt like hours when I was in there. Once I heard the door slide shut, I waited another five minutes or so until my ADHD couldn't take it any longer, and I went upstairs. The man was gone, and the house was mostly intact. There were a few things missing or out of place, however. A few hours later, it was around 3 a.m., my father came back and asked why the house was like it was. I said it was my fault, and he chewed me out for being a nuisance when my uncle was in critical condition. I never told anyone until now what really happened, since I just didn't feel comfortable sharing before now. And at the time, I remained silent, as I didn't want to put any more on my aunt's plate. Even thinking about it now, it's pants shitting terrifying. Oddly enough, the house burned down a month or two after my uncle passed away. I think it was a lit stove or something, but I don't remember the details. My aunt survived, as she wasn't home, but she's been moving house to house since then. I really feel bad for her having to come out of retirement. Sometimes I wonder if that man came back and left the stove on, but I don't like to entertain that thought. This happened at the end of summer of 2016. To give you a bit of a backstory, my boyfriend and I were around 20. So, my boyfriend Max and I used to share an apartment with another married couple. Mind you, they were awesome. Unfortunately, Florida wasn't what they wanted, so they decided to move to Pennsylvania. Max and I started looking for people to replace them because rent where we lived was pricey, and we didn't want to have to pay for the whole thing on our own. It was in a very nice area but not close enough to the city, so most people they told us they could drop by to check the place out would flake 
one last minute. Eventually, we found this person that seemed to be a very nice person and a laid-back girl. She then explained how she was the only one looking for a place for her boyfriend, Dan. Now, I tend to see people's auras when I meet them, and I always get a certain feeling when I don't like them immediately. I'm not a judgmental person in the slightest. It's just something I feel and can't help. I did not like this person straight off the bat, but I tried to give him the benefit of the doubt because everyone else seemed to be okay with him. So I thought I might be wrong and I was hoping I was. As the time went by, said Dan started being super loud, invited people over on weeknights till four in the morning, playing music loud enough for it to sound like it was being played from our room, etc. Other annoying shit too and beyond disrespectful, especially to me. Max wouldn't do anything about it and I'm kind of glad because I know Dan would have wanted to fight him or something. Dan was 22 at the time and had the mentality of a 12 year old. Side note. We later found out that Dan had previous mugshots for shoplifting and other stuff. He also threatened to get me beat up several times. I just wanted to give you a bit of insight on Dan so you understand what is about to happen. Buckle up. It was a Wednesday night. I got home at 5.30, and as I was walking upstairs and almost to the third floor, which is where we lived, I saw him coming out of the apartment, but I didn't say anything because I don't like him, so I mostly ignored him. But he started yelling at me and telling me to look at the apartment. I look inside from the doorway and I saw nothing wrong, so I asked what he was talking about. And in a still angry voice, he claimed that we had robbed him and that he had also just gotten home to this. But I saw all the furniture in there and whatnot, so I'm thinking he was on one of his drugs, which he usually was. I came in and I didn't notice that my Wii U is gone, but the rest of my consoles were there. GameCube, PS3, Xbox, etc. So at this point, I was already suspicious of him. I tried to keep calm as much as I could, and I called Max to see how far from home he is. We usually both got home around the same time. As I'm calling, Dan yelled at me again that he had called the police, and they were on their way, and in these exact words, he said, Do whatever you need to do, because the police are on their way. When he told me that, I immediately knew he had been home for a while because he must have had time to hide all the weapons and drugs and God knows what else he had. Within five minutes, the cops were pulling up and so was Max. One officer went upstairs with Dan and Max to write down everything that was missing and the other stayed downstairs. I stay with him just chatting. According to Max, we are missing a lot in our room, but Dan is only missing his PS4. I did ask him at last if it was possible to search Dan's car, and I also said if he needed to search my car or Max's car, we'd both be okay with it. He said it wasn't necessary, but agreed to search Dan's car. The officers didn't seem to like Dan very much right off the bat either. Once they all came back downstairs, officers asked Dan if they could search his car and that they also needed his ID. He said he was okay with them searching his car, but he had to get his ID and keys from the apartment. Max and I followed him upstairs. We saw him get his wallet and keys and he left the apartment. We don't want to be nosy and stay downstairs while they searched his car, so we stayed in the apartment. A few minutes go by, and he's still not downstairs with the cops. So, we started looking around the neighborhood, 
but he had already vanished. How convenient. But since he had agreed that they could search his car and in no moment said they couldn't, they went ahead and started looking if the car was unlocked. And it fucking was. We found all of our stuff in his car. One of the two 3DSs that were missing. Our PS4 controller. We had no PS4, but we used it to play PC games. Max's laptop. Some Wii U games, etc. The next morning, I put all of his stuff out by the dumpster and had a locksmith change our locks. I thought of putting a restraining order against him, but ended up never going through with it. A few weeks later, we see his car parked outside, a few yards from our building. But we pretended like we didn't see him, and we just watched him from our room, with 911 ready to be dialed. Eventually, he just left. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true intruder stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Sugared Spite, Samantha Place, Colt Stonewolf, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Chrissy Elias, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita B., Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for remaining loyal supporters of Back to Ashes. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't be here and neither would the channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you're sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.